F to the X. Welcome to the very first down the middle episode when we're going to be talking currencies. Uh, this is not a subject that we've delved into before. On the other hand, the most amazing currency thinker has been buried on the sell side for a very long time. Think of sell side and compliance as being one in one, as in shackled, as in you cannot talk to the media. Uh, I was privileged enough before he passed away, actually, to have Tobias Lefkovich on my show, and, and that was his first time being able to speak out uh, after being on the sell side for, for 20 years. Today we have Brent Donnelly. He's president of Spectra Markets. I've known him for quite some time. We've gone fishing together. We won't talk about that. Uh, but he's a great guy. Uh, he's Canadian, which I'm, you know, I'm discovering that Canadians in general do so well on Wall Street. And rather than me uh, give you his resume, because he's been to a lot of places, I'm going to let Brent jump in. He started in 95. I started in 96. So we started on Wall Street within months of one another. But why don't you, A, uh, tell us how you started out in the business, and B, that little moment in between when you were not on the sell side, what did you do? Welcome. Sure. Hey, hey, so we won't talk about getting drunk in the canoe. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Boom! I started in 1995, <laughs> and I'm from the generation of um, Liar's Poker, the movie Wall Street, all that stuff. And actually, one irony of all that is that, and reminiscences of a stock operator obviously was has always been big. So one irony of all three of those pieces of amazing art is they're all cautionary tales, right? They're all basically telling you don't go to Wall Street because like it's a horrendous place. But reading that stuff at 14, 15 years old, I was like, I'm going there. I'm going to be rich. So um, I was a product of, of, that, of that era. And so all I wanted to do was be a trader basically from the age of 14 or so. So out of school, I went to uh, Citibank and there was no sophisticated analyst programs back in those days. It was like, you know, hey, there's an empty seat. Go sit over there for a couple of days and see if you like it and sit over there for a bit. So literally, I sat one day at three different desks. One was T-bills, one was structured products, and one was FX, which is what usually what in institutional people call currency trading. So in retail, it's usually called Forex. And in institutional side, people usually say FX, so the FX trading desk or whatever. So T-bills don't move. Structured products are like very cerebral, quanti, kind of like not trading in, in my mind. So I was like, all right, how about currency trading? And now it's like 26 years later, I'm still doing it. I mean, I love it. So things have changed a lot in the industry um, since I started. So when I started in 95, the spot desk, so spot is um, just a normal currency, the way you would go to the airport and change currencies like a corporation needs 200 million euros and they have dollars. They come to come to a bank and they say, hey, exchange these. And that's what a currency trader does. That's called spot. And so in those days, there were 30 people on the on the Citibank spot desk trading, you know, various sizes of each currency. So you'd have like the small dollar yen trader, medium dollar yen, large dollar yen based on transaction size. Now, fast forward to 2021, almost all of that market making has become automated. So now most spot desks are like three or four people. So that just gives you a sense of like just hyperspacing through time, how much things have evolved. So in those days, every single transaction was going through an individual trader like me, was recorded um, manually in a computer, but manually. So you had to like punch in the thing. Usually you kept your position on a piece of paper. And the, the whole thing was just trying to keep your position straight and make sure you didn't make mistakes. It was very transactional and flow oriented. So I would liken it to being a blackjack dealer. Like that's kind of fun, but intellectually not all that stimulating. So I did that for a couple of years and I've always had like a creative side of my brain. So a friend and I had written a movie script and I was like super naive. So I'm like, I'm going to go home to Canada and produce our movie. So that was not realistic. And like we tried to raise money and never did. However, um, that was when the NASDAQ bubble was just starting to heat up. And there were a lot of um, like, so people would use the term bucket shop, but it's actually not the right term. These were like, there was a lot of very professional day trading firms that trained you and they were legit. And I went to one of those. So it's like a trading floor. 
where it's free to sit down, but you have to pay, you pay commission. So I started doing that. And then actually I wrote a cartoon um, or I had a concept for a cartoon, which I made a pilot for with a friend of mine. And we sold that to um, a studio in Montreal. So we wrote like 13 episodes of the show. It was on TV in Canada. Um, so that was super fun. And I learned so much about like the inside of like, you know, um, recruiting the voice actors and you have a vision in your head of like what the voice is going to sound like from this character. And then, you know, you bring someone in and it's totally different, but you're like, oh my God, that's genius. So there's like some really cool aspects to that, that, that I learned. Wait, 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 stop, stop, Brent. Sure, what sure. was the cartoon called? Because we can find anything on the yeah. World Wide web. And what was it about? So the, it was called Daft Planet, like Crazy Planet. Um, and it was essentially like riffing on how technology and pop culture and music are getting more and more crazy over the years and like excel, like the acceleration of culture and that kind of thing. But through the eyes of like a 12 year old kid, two 12 year old kids. Um, so the animation was pretty chintzy. Like the, the episodes cost a lot of money still like $250,000 or whatever, but that's cheap for a, to make a cartoon. Um, so, but in those days, that was when South Park was just kicking off. So the big emphasis in the, in the, like animated animation industry was story over over animation quality like obviously south park animation quality was bad but it didn't matter so we kind of squeaked through because of that um it's on youtube you can see it i mean there's some there's a lot of like sophisticated humor like um like one of the episodes is like about the kids get addicted to video games so it's all uh like train spotting and requiem for a dream and like those drug movie kind of references um so it, it was i think it was a decent product but it looks pretty janky if you look at it now because it's 20 years old but anyways so i i was trading the nasdaq bubble and i had a lot of success doing that um i had a specific methodology that just worked really well and um then what happened was around 2002 so i did that for about four or five years around 2002 the nasdaq went to decimals instead of fractions and so that changed the microstructure of the stock market a lot in, in ways that unless you're really doing short-term trading, didn't really matter. But if you were really, do, if you're doing a lot of short-term trading, it made a huge difference. Um, and then the TV show got canceled. And then I was thinking about getting married. I'm like, now I'm almost 30. I'm like an actual, almost an adult. Um, <laughs> so then I got back into um, a similar job, actually trading FX again. Um, however, by that point, the industry had changed a lot. And so now like, I'll just fast forward all the way through. So I worked at a hedge fund and then I worked at a couple of different banks, including Lehman when it went under. Um, but in the end, my role since about 2004 has been very similar, which is I was a market maker and part of being a market maker is, say, um, clients ask you like, what do you think a lot? So like, what do you think dollar yen is going to do today? I need to buy a billion dollars in the next 24 hours you know, what's the best way to do that and, and that kind of thing. And what I found was I was telling salespeople the same thing over and over. It seemed really inefficient. So I started writing a note in just like a quick email. And then client, uh, then salespeople would say, hey, can I send this to a client? And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't look very good. Let me just clean it up. And then slowly, so you know my note. So since the, around 2004, it's become more sophisticated and nicely packaged or whatever. Um, but it's still the same idea. It's just basically like, here are my thoughts on the market. And as you know, I've, I talk a lot more about equities now, Bitcoin and stuff. Um, and so over time, that actually became more important than my market making. Um, and also, like I said, market making has become more and more automated. So now I've moved to a, a new job where I'm actually covering clients, which are hedge funds and, and asset managers, advising them on FX trades and derivatives trades. So we, um, we directly you know, facilitate FX options and FX trades. Um, and then I, they've created a new company for me called Spectra Markets, which is me attempting to like deliver my content to a bigger audience because I wrote a couple of books and one of the big takeaways from writing those books was there's a really huge appetite for trading and ma like global macro um, information and learning um, out there. And it's not very well satisfied 
in in certain lanes which like my specific lane which is kind of tactical macro there aren't that many books and and that much really like high quality material so i found there was a lot of appetite for that so now i'm trying to like satisfy that and going back to the cartoon thing and all that it the thing i love doing is basically trading and writing so this gives me a chance to write in an unconstrained way like you said at the top of the show about the compliance stuff is that when you work at a bank um I don't think people fully appreciate, unless you work at a bank, how intense the compliance infrastructure is. Um, and it's there for good reason, right? I mean, these are commercial banks that are under a lot of scrutiny, many of which got bailed out um, in 2008. So as an employee of those firms, you're, you know, you're not going to be running around, say, criticizing the Fed or, or whatever, uh, anything else that you might want to do that's a little bit controversial. So now being at Spectrum Markets, I'm kind of free from like the the compliance bureaucracy. Um, and the thing is, like, I loved working at the banks over the years. So like, I'm, I'm not like a huge critic of the banks. I, I mean, I had a great career working at banks and, and tons of my friends still work at banks and all that. Um, it was just more specifically for me personally, I wanted more creative freedom and it's impossible. There's There's a very strict limit to your creative freedom if you work at a commercial bank. Well, I mean, your Twitter handle is literally a mirror image of itself. I don't even know how you did that. So, <laughs> it's the, and so you're not going to tell me, are you? <laughs> my, my kind of like philosophy with my writing is, is that it's supposed to be serious and professional, but not boring. So my biggest beef with um, like bank research, especially, because that's what I was mostly exposed to. Like your stuff is not boring. You're talking about historical events and analogies that are really cool and stuff like that. But a lot of institutional, um, and not, not all of it, because some of it's really good, but a lot of institutional um, finance product is very boring and like math oriented and- Dry. You, know, you can communicate something interesting and creative, but still be rigorous and mathematical at the same time. So like, that's what I'm kind of trying to do is like, have a little bit of fun. So uh, my upside down or mirror image uh, font is just to reflect that, like, hopefully I'm not like super boring anyways. So um, your, your views right now on currencies are kind of squishy. Um, there's not a ton of conviction, which is fine. It actually reflects the world we live in. But take us back to a year in your career when you like went into the year and you were super, super adamant and you knew that that one currency was going to move against another currency and how did that play out and what was going on in the background because we seem i mean today especially it seems like markets are teflon and it's really hard to have to, to see big moves but take us back to a time when that wasn't the case sure so i think one thing that's really challenging in general with i i think this is true with macro all over the place not just fx is that many, many things happen that people think make sense, but they don't happen on the timeline that people expect. So a good example is, so for me, my, my trading style is more tactical and less, like I would never have a position for a year, for example, but I might have a view, a pretty much a core view that lasts for most of a year. Um, so an, a good example of, of that would be 2014, when it, it was kind of the theory was a little bit wrong, but the theory was that the Fed was getting closer to normalizing um, at the same time as the BOJ was still doing like Abenomics and mega easing. And the ECB looked like they were about to start going to quantitative easing as the Fed was hiking. So there's a lot of uh, monetary policy divergence. And generally, monetary policy divergence is like the number one driver of currency markets. It, it isn't always, but that tends to be the number one driver. So in 2014, it looked like, you know, you got to be long dollars because Fed's hiking and everyone else is easing. And like that should be the easiest trade macro wise in the world. However, then from January to June, July, basically of 2014, the dollar did almost literally absolutely nothing. Like, say, for example, dollar yen might move on average, say, between seven and 12 percent in a year, let's just say. It was in a range of about 1% almost for six months, like with a couple of deviations, but it was basically like nah, doing nothing. And so to maintain your conviction in the face of that is really difficult. Um, 
And uh, that's one thing that I've actually learned. Um, so one of my books is just basically all the, essentially what I've learned in 25 years of trading. And one of the things that, that I think is really important in trade is And this is, wait, wait, wait Brent, this, I, I want to pump your book so somebody can, can read it. This, is this the art of oh, currency? Sure. The art of currency uh, trading? This is Alpha Trader. So oh. Alpha Trader is like the mindset methodology and mathematics of trading. So it's essentially like where my trade ideas come from, how I risk manage them, all that kind of thing. Um, and one thing that can be very frustrating for trade people with trading time horizons is that things just don't always happen when you think they should, right? Like, so uh, that that was a really good trade because I stuck with it and eventually the, the dollar went to the moon and I made a ton of money. But, you know, say you're buying one month calls in because you think the dollar is going to go up. Well, it was month seven and eight when the when the dollar finally went up. So if you bought one month options for six months, by the seventh month, you're down so much on those other six months that that you're dead. So like that's that's what happened to me in 07 actually was the in that time it there was kind of like bubbles and everything right like the housing bubble obviously but there was a big bubble in FX in carry um so essentially all these funds is very similar to what long term capital did in 1998 so these funds would buy the currencies that had the highest yield with a ton of leverage and then short the currencies that had no yield so you buy like Australian dollars and New Zealand and you sell yen against it. And that's like an 8% yield pickup and you lever it four times and you should be making 32%. So obviously there's no such thing as free money. Um, and it became very clear that it was kind of getting close to a bubble. Like there was, I think Deutsche launched a carry uh, FX ETF at that time, which is often an anecdotal sign of, of bubbles. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff. So, however, that year I was trying to be short almost all year and really it didn't work except for one month in August, everything collapsed, but I had lost so much money from January to July that like, I barely made it back what I had lost. Um, so it's really important for anyone that's doing any kind of trading that you have to understand like the timing and structuring of trades can be just as important as, as the direction. So, you know, if you're super macro as an investor, then really you just need to get the direction. And that's why, you know, buy and hold over time tends to be a good strategy because you don't have to time anything. You just stocks in the long run have gone up and whether that's true in the future, I guess we can talk about, but um, whereas if you're trading, you know, say one month to three months time horizon, you're trying to not only get the direction right, but also the timing um, and the structure of the trade so in, in terms of FX now, I can kind of give you just like the broad overview of what's happening. Um, because the interesting thing is that so much money has flowed into the US in the last five years under like, you know, one of the acronyms is TINA, which is there is no alternative. Um, all the, not just US money, um, but like retail money obviously has gone completely ape. Um, but then also foreigners, so like SoftBank, the Swiss National Bank, uh, all kinds of foreign entities have all been buying U.S., um, mostly tech, right, because of the way the indexes are weighted. So that has been a massive um, tailwind for the dollar. So a big part of reason. So going into last year, people thought with the fiscal craziness that the dollar would probably collapse because you had so much spending and, you know, this and that. Um, the twin deficits was kind of like the theme. But the twin deficits didn't matter because so many, so much money was coming in to, to U.S. tech that the dollar just kept going up. So now that framework of like it's all about rates isn't really true anymore. It's actually more about equity flows. So as the money has been coming out of the Nasdaq recently, um, the the that has actually been putting downward pressure on the dollar. And and funny enough, you saw the same thing in 1999, 2000. Like the dollar was was much, much, much higher um, then than it is now. And it was the exact same, it was the same mechanism. Money was flowing into tech and money was coming from all over the world. And the weights of technology were becoming so large that anyone that bought the index was essentially just buying, in those days, it was the four horsemen. So I think it was, I mean, you probably know better than me, Cisco, yeah. Microsoft, Intel, and whatever the other one was. Um, so it's, it's a similar dynamic. And then what you saw when the bubble in 99 unwound was that the, that was essentially the high in the dollar. It wasn't quite because 
the euro actually launched at that time. And there were some like existential questions about the, the euro in 99, 2000 as well. But then by around 2001, 2002, the dollar basically went down in a straight line, like a lot, like 35, 40% against most currencies. So like, for example, euro dollar went from one, like one double O to 1.60 um, between 2001 and 2007. Um, and that was when, actually just speaking of anecdotal things, he had like Giselle, the, the model was like asking to rewrite all her contracts in euros. In euros, I remember that. That was like a sign of the top. Um, so I'm a fan of those anecdotal things, although, you know, you have to be careful not to cherry pick the ones that fit your, your prior view. But um, so, yeah, that's the interesting dynamic now is that there's many similarities across a lot of different markets um, between 99, 2000 and now. And the, the FX market is similar. And if anything, you could actually say like the dollar has gone up in the last few years, but it's been very it's been very unimpulsive. Like the dollar hasn't actually gone up all that much relative to what you would expect, um, which to me suggests that there are a lot of dollar negative forces, primarily being the twin deficits are absolutely monstrous and getting bigger because of goods, right? So in, through COVID, when people stop buying services and, and only bought goods, that's bad for, for the US deficits, uh, for the current account and trade deficits. So there's a lot of sort of um, invisible downward pressure on the dollar, but it's been offset by these tech flows. And so to me, the, the sort of like macro direction for the dollar is much more likely to be down over time because, you know, my belief, I don't know if you want to get into the whole monetary policy cycles now. No, I mean, I, I do. And I, I, I just want to contextualize what you're talking about. And Michael, sure. Michael Hartnett, uh, at Bank of America does a pretty good job of, of, of really zooming out and giving the biggest of the big pictures. And you know, a trillion dollars flowing into U.S. equities took out the prior two decades of inflows, uh, superseded in, in one year's time. I mean, 2021 was as extraordinary as, as it could possibly be in terms of equity inflows into the United States that people are always like, look at the differential between U.S. stock market and the rest of the world. And I'm like, well, no, sh I mean, no kidding. Of course, look at the flows. Yeah. I mean, they had to rescale all those charts, like the y-axis all exploded on all those charts because the same with retail. So it, it's coming from every, um, every angle. Um, well, and I agree, his stuff is fantastic. So before we move on to my favorite area of central banks, um, when you said Giselle getting paid in euros, gee, that reminded me that People have started to be, uh, you know, people have started to ask to be paid in Bitcoin. So I'm just going to push that button, Brent. I'm just going to go there. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a similar concept is that, you know, you don't want to get paid in something at the lows, but let's be serious here. It's complete nonsense. Like euros are convertible to dollars at almost zero transaction cost. Bitcoin can be converted to dollars. Like if you want to get paid in Bitcoin, just get your dollars and buy Bitcoin. It's, it's just like a PR stunt. But it, what it is, is people riding the bandwagon of what's popular. And that's why it's an anecdotal indicator, because if the mayor of New York is saying, I'm going to get paid in Bitcoin, you know, he's not going to be doing that at the lows, right? He's going to be doing that at the highs. But if he really wanted Bitcoin, you, you know what he does is he opens a Coinbase account and buys some Bitcoin. He doesn't need to get paid in Bitcoin. It's just like a nonsensical PR strategy that people use. Um, that might or might not get a few uh, comments on YouTube. I'm just giving you fair warning right now. <laughs> that hey, for the record, I don't really, I don't, I don't have a strong view on him. I'm just talking about when people do that. It's a PR stunt. It's not like a, it's not an actual legitimate macroeconomic view that they need to get Bitcoin because the dollar is about to collapse. If you think the exactly. dollar is about to collapse, just buy Bitcoin. But you have written about the last Bitcoin cycle. Yeah, recently. And maybe you can walk us through that because you're seeing some parallels play out. Sure. So I think one thing that that people tend to to not be very good at um, when they're specialists in specific asset classes is understanding the, the impact of macro. So the global monetary cycles are absolutely critical for every single asset class, right? Whether it goes up or down. 
So if you're um, only looking at like which L1 is going to beat which L2 or sorry, which L1 is going to win in, you know, a Solana or Avalanche or, or Bitcoin or Ethereum, you're kind of missing the bigger picture, which was one of the big use cases for, for crypto was to defend against dollar debasement and, and the end of fiat currencies um, as central banks print like crazy animals. Um, and that part of the cycle is gone. So you can see this is a good, this chart is a good example of we just crossed below the zero line of global central bank liquidity, whether it's being added or subtracted. So liquidity is now starting to come out of the system and markets aren't stupid. They, they'll get ahead of that. So that's to me why crypto has been in um, a cyclical bear market. And I've been writing about this since November. So this isn't hindsight, hairy type stuff. Um, when the Fed starts withdrawing liquidity and the world starts taking liquidity away, that's not good for risky assets. And crypto is a risky asset. Um, it's not a safe haven. So the issue is that you have, so the monetary cycle policy, or sorry, the monetary policy cycle um, is bearish for risky assets in general. Anything that was buoyed up by the liquidity burst now is at risk that that liquidity gets taken away. So, you know, that applies to NASDAQ or crypto and, and, and other things. And, and the last time we saw the, the, the charts flip was 2017 headed into 2018. Correct. We went from like, like 2.1 trillion of global QE to like, oops, we're going negative here. Right, right. And I think that the relative amount of QE, personally, this is my own opinion, the relative amount of balance sheet expansion is more important for asset prices than rate hikes. So the fact that the Fed is moving quantitative tightening earlier, to me, is even more bearish for crypto. And then if you look at, I don't know if you want to go into the weeds on this, so I'll keep this part short, but there's, there's also the halving cycle, which is basically the speed at which Bitcoin are able to be mined is divided by two every four years. So that's called the halving cycle. And there's a point in the halving cycle right after it happens that Bitcoin has tended to outperform. And then now we're in the latter part where it tends to perform very poorly. So I will say the sample size is small because there haven't been that many four year cycles in the life of Bitcoin, but historically that's been the way. So what you have now is the halving cycle, which is more of like a internal thing, idiosyncratic to, to Bitcoin. And then the macro cycle, which is the Fed, they're both going the wrong way if you're long crypto. So that's why I've been bearish since November. And really I'll either be jet leaning bearish or neutral until the next Fed easing cycle. And then probably we go like beyond the moon in crypto because I do feel like the use case is legit when central banks are printing money. However, the problem you have if you're long crypto is they're not, right? So if they're not printing money, then the dollar debasement trade doesn't really work. And the thing I think is that people aren't intellectually honest. So like on the when when quantitative easing or QE is happening, everyone's like, well, by definition, that means crypto has to go up and stocks have to go up. But then when QT happens, which is the opposite of QE, like literally mathematically the opposite of QE, there's a different group of people who generally their prior was bearish, who will say, okay, that's bearish. But the people that are bullish never actually take the new information. And so like, I think one of my skills is that I'm just pretty agnostic. Like I don't have a permanent view one way or the other. I try to just ride the cycles. And, you know, that can mean that, that it, sometimes you don't have a view and that that's maybe harder to sell if, if you're writing all the time. Um, but for me, that's just more my style. I think it's more my personality is to, to start from like an agnostic point of view and then look at, try to look at what the information says. And right now the information says liquidity is decreasing um, and that's not good for speculative assets. So you go, you can create a spectrum of like from least to most speculative and web three is the most, and you know, you can go from there. Um, and to me, some parts of web three, like the game, game fight part is actually getting, was probably a bubble at one point. So you have some really, really speculative assets that are going to have a lot of difficulty maintaining value in a world where the Fed is about to between you know, sometime between April and July, uh, quantitative tightening is going to start, which means the Fed's balance sheet is going to get smaller. And I believe that's bad for risky assets. 
um, can you explain, because I think that, I, I think Jay Powell's going to do his level best to not use the term quantitative tightening. So can you explain, as if I'm a fifth grader, what the Treasury maturity schedule is and compare that to the makeup of the Fed's balance sheet and the fact that Jay Powell doesn't actually have to say quantitative tightening. He can just allow organic roll off. And in 2022 and 2023, that's a big deal. Right, right. So last time when they reduced the balance sheet, they never really sold. I mean, there were some tiny sales of, of um, high yield or whatever, but generally they didn't really sell assets. What happens is the assets start expiring and they put a cap on how much they'll allow to expire and the balance sheet gets smaller in, in that way. And we're talking about small numbers like in 2018, the balance sheet, um, you know, the monthly contraction, the balance sheet might be between like uh, half a percent and one percent. Um, and when they're increasing the balance sheet, as you know, you know, they increased it 20% in, in less than a year at one point or whatever. So they, it's, it's very always, that's, that's part of the problem of the current form of capitalism is that the accommodation is extremely aggressive and the withdrawal is very, uh, slow. And often by the time the withdrawal is happening, the timing's horrendous because you like now you've already got fiscal drag and many other things that could be weighing on the economy, but the Fed takes a very long time to withdraw. And so what will happen when, when it starts is essentially, like you said, they just sit there and do nothing, but the, the path or, or the default path of the balance sheet is that because of the maturation of the securities that are on the balance sheet, it will very slowly get smaller. And like you're saying, it's, it is a massive number, but relative to the size of the balance sheet, it's pretty small, but, but continually month after month, it adds up pretty fast. So, I mean, this is a really big topic in terms of what the Fed will do and what they should do. And there's a lot of different uh, viewpoints on it. Like to me, it makes a lot more sense for them to focus on, on quantitative tightening at, at first. It keeps the yield, yield curve steeper and um, it's generally kind of like makes more sense considering the size of the balance sheet, but there's a group within the Fed that thinks that. So for example, the Kansas City Fed wrote a thing saying they should actually contract the balance sheet before they hike, which if I was doing it, that's what I would do, but obviously I'm not. Um, but then there's also 2018, which is the last time they did this, is not that long ago. And people remember, you know, there were some really big down moves in equities. And so the question is, what's the priority? Now, I don't think that the Fed's priority is equities anymore. So I think that's a pretty important dynamic that's changed. Um, the politics were always, for almost my whole life, were, were more always about jobs and, and for since 2008 about equities and jobs. And now the politics are really about inflation, right? Like that's what people actually care about is inflation, not, not jobs because everyone has a job and not equities because like they've gone up so much. And also there's a pretty strong, I don't know if I'd say understanding cause that like makes it sound like it's a truth, but there's a strong belief that the QE impact on equities has contributed a lot to, to the perception or reality of wealth inequality um, because obviously rich people own stocks. So if you send the NASDAQ from 4,000 to 16,000, which happened since 2016, that's going to benefit rich people a lot more than, than people work that are living pay, paycheck to paycheck. So the politics on that have changed as well. So my, my view is kind of that, that they're not really going to care as much about that. And then the other thing that's kind of overlaid on all of this is that there's always been this thing called the Fed put, which I know you know about, but I'm just in case anyone doesn't know exactly what that is, which is the belief in the market that if stocks drop 20% or more, the Fed will cut or, or ease monetary policy. And that's easy to do when inflation's 2%, right? Because in secular stagnation, you just go, well, whether it's at 2.3 or 1.8, it honestly is, is a joke, right? It, it's a rounding error. But when inflation is at 7% and stocks drop, drop 20%, to me, it's not as obvious that they can cut because like cutting rates when or doing more QE when inflation is at 7% could potentially be like a, a really, really major turning point for this whole debt trap dynamic, right? 
Well, I mean, and plus it's, it's an election year. And right. as, as an FX trader, you know, th these are all things that you have to take into account. In fact, I, I would ask you the question, uh, in an environment like this, in a backdrop like this, when things are as sensitive as they are right now, when it's very easy for the Fed to break something, um, do geopolitics matter more against this backdrop? Well, I think in general, it's been mostly that so it geopolitics are a strange thing. So the way I would put it is that you, you could say like most earthquakes aren't very serious, but obviously some of them destroy cities, right? So that's like an important, it's like a power law thing. So geopolitics is kind of like that, like where most geopolitical um, situations could be have important ramifications for the people involved and, you know, the <laughs> the residents of those countries, but for markets generally, most of the time it's a shrug and we move on, right? Um, however, there are occasional times where geopolitics can be absolutely massive. Like, of course, 9-11 is the biggest possible one you could imagine, um, but there are others as well. So the, the Russia-Ukraine thing is, is definitely interesting, um, but it's, you know, it, I don't have a view on whether it happens, but I would say a Russian move into, into Ukraine is bigger than normal or bigger than say Crimea because there's a cohort of people in the world that believe that, that China and Taiwan could actually, there could be enough of a distraction from Russia that China maybe thinks about doing something as well. Um, again, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but right. what I am aware of is what the narratives are. And I know that's a narrative that people will embrace is that, you know, this could be a domino in the sort of like the the ongoing, very slow motion decline of the U.S. as the ultimate like single monolithic power in the world um, that, you know, Russia going into Ukraine could be a little catalyst to an accelerated portion of that. So uh, people are definitely watching that very closely. Um, but to me, what it, what it is, is like, it's a big deal if it happens, but I don't have a, uh, there's experts that could have a better handle on the probability of it happening than, than I could. Well, but on a practical level, if you want to go back to currencies, uh, you know, Xi Jinping wants an unprecedented third term sometime around November. And my, my, my favorite, uh, my favorite little factoid is that for people born in the year of the snake, which Xi Jinping was, the month of October is very unlucky. So it's kind of like oh, Jack. Yes, it's it's like Jackson Hole. They don't announce the actual dates and who's going to be speaking and <laughs> until like the very last minute. So I'm voting for November for the for the, for the twentieth People's Congress. But at the at the same time, when you bring up the idea of Taiwan, I immediately think to how how strong the yuan is right now, and that's right, problematic right. for somebody who wants to make sure that there's no social unrest in the year that he wants to be reelected. Well, you know what's interesting about that? I hadn't thought of this until you just said it. Is that um, do you remember what happened after the last time there was an Olympics in China? Well, was this um, the devaluation? Well, it was August 2008. So basically everything kind yeah. of held together and then the, the world ended. So there, there's always this argument that China obviously has a lot of this. This isn't an argument. This is probably a fact, but they have a lot of control over their economy and market prices. But no one has ultimate control over market prices in the end. You saw that with many, you know, the Bank of England in 1992. Um, you saw it with the Swiss National Bank in 2015. You know, government forces trying to hold markets for a prolonged period can work for a very long time, a longer than speculators. Most speculators can stay solvent, but not forever, right? So if there is something like that going on, then you would think after they're, they're holding everything together, the, the real estate deleveraging and all that, they're probably trying to hold it together until the, con until the Olympics and the Congress are over. And then you kind of go, all right, we did the best we can. And then you just let everything go. Um, on the currency side, that's been a real, real head scratcher for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of money has been lost trying to, to go against that move. And the thing is, it, again, they, they use the currency as a policy tool. So when inflation was rising, um, so now inflation doesn't look like as much of a threat there um, as it does over here. But when it did look like a threat, PPI was through 10%, pork prices were going nuts and all that. It kind of makes sense to keep your currency stronger um, and then you can buy foreign goods more, more easily and, and keep inflation tame. Um, and then at the same time, 
the speculators are always trying to go, we're trying to go the other way. So that creates like, you know, a, a bit of pressure to when people have to cover their shorts and buy, buy you on again. Um, so there's been like that speculative thing, which has been hurting people. And then there's also been a, a pretty amazing carry trade, which is more like on the institutional side, um, where if you bought Chinese bonds, they're one of the few bonds where you could actually earn like a pretty decent interest rate. So there's a whole bunch of like inside baseball stuff with that, like the, the Wigby, which is a big index. Um, they got added to that. China got added to that. So there's been a lot of just like passive um, money flowing into, into Chinese fixed income, Chinese bonds specifically. And now that they're starting to cut rates, um, there's probably an interesting opportunity to, to go the other way. Um, you just have to do it in a way that you don't have to time it perfectly because kind of going back to our original conversation, right. this thing's like impossible to time. Um, but they've shown that they can lose control of it. So in 2015, um, they tried to do this kind of controlled devaluation of the yuan. And I mean, the, everything went absolutely pear-shaped. Like it was a goat rodeo that the dollar China exploded. They lost control of it for a while. They were intervening like crazy. And actually it triggered a domino story as well. Like um, commodities collapsed because of it. And um, so- Capital flight. I mean, it was everything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a really good indicator to watch um, because essentially it's a policy lever. So you can look at it as- a policy tool that they have that they control like 95% of the time. And then once in a while they lose control to the speculators um, or to the, to market forces. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my view on it is that like it's, gr it keeps on grinding stronger and stronger, but it makes less and less sense as time goes on. So it's, it's definitely something to watch for um, because there's a lot of sort of, very slow motion grinding, but very negative things happening there, especially on the on the housing deleveraging side where, you know, they I'm sure you've seen the charts of like home ownership in China is is so, so, so high. I mean, many people own two homes and all that. So that's going to be like a multi year deleveraging story, um, but it hasn't come through the currency at all. No, it hasn't. And, you know, our 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 mutual friend uh, Leland Miller has some really extraordinary views on 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 how uncomfortable Xi Jinping is with the whole idea of this Fed tightening cycle that he is just he's just wiggling in his shorts right now because it's something that is not in his control what the Fed does yet what the Fed does affects the currency that's an aspect that that China doesn't control and the other thing that that Leland has uh, commented on is the copper market and the fact that that there's a copper market in Shanghai and the Chinese authorities are not kind of accustomed to speculators being able to, to take the reins occasionally. And yet we've seen that in copper. Right. I mean, that's the interesting thing about if you're going to try to build like a socialist um, dictatorship or I guess whatever you want to call it with capitalist qualities sort of brewing underneath, man, that's like a quite the, the needle to thread in the long run. And like I said, We've seen many examples of policymakers holding stuff wherever they want, but in that's you know ultimately market forces are are very strong and and even stronger than than government forces generally. So we'll see how it plays out. But so um, so we have a new and different macro Brent. So it's like wow. I mean, you're like way out there. So what are what, what, what are some of the things that you're that you're following? Uh, I mean, on the macro side, what is what are, what are some of your go tos and um, and and go global and and then come domestic? Sure. So, I mean, my main kind of global macro view now is that so one source of edge that I have is I just talk to a lot of people. Like I have a lot of clients and a lot of connections from oh, so just from being around for a long time um, and working at different places. And I worked at a hedge fund. I worked at banks. I worked at investment banks. So I get a good sense, I think, of like what the vibe is. And people are just way too complacent on risky assets, in my opinion. So we have just gone through like literally the greatest monetary policy experiment in history, right? Like every single central bank blew up their balance sheet um, and fiscal spending went absolutely nuts to, so Ben Hunt has written about this, um, like the snip between spending and taxation. There, there's so many snips, right? Between 
things that used to be linked like taxation and revenue that have just completely decoupled. And so that led to a completely different mentality on fiscal um, and on monetary policy. And both of those things are reversing. So you have now, you know, for example, the child tax credit just ended. That's a lot of money out of people's pockets that was getting spent. Yeah. Um, and then you have obviously the turn in the Fed. And if you look at where we've come, like if you look at where the Fed, where Fed expectations were, like let's say in June of last year versus where they are now, if someone had forecast that the Fed was going to hike in March, probably end QE in March, and maybe be doing quantitative tightening in July of 2022, like people would have said, dude, you're an idiot. There's no zero chance that's going to happen. So like the pace of this pivot is really, really fast. And I think that's underappreciated. And what you see is a lot of people saying, ah, you know, like usually three rate hikes before stocks start going down. People are using the analogy of, of the last four cycles, which were generally like secular stagnation, slow motion. Yeah, and they lasted like a decade. I mean, this right. is like- the last cycle, QE3 ended in 2012. They hiked in basically 2016, but late 2015. And QT was 2018. That's like six years of runway. Now we're talking about like, the biggest expansion of monetary of, of central bank balance sheets in history. And now we're going to do a contraction like 12 months, not even really it's from the time they stop buying to the time they start sell or start running off could actually be like a four month window. And last time we we're talking about six years. So I feel like saying like any analogy that people use that, Oh, fed rate hikes aren't bad for risky assets. Absolutely. That was true in the past. But this isn't, is not, to me anyways, is not analogous at all. Um, so we can put up this chart of, or this table that shows the starting position of the economy uh, each time that the Fed started tightening. So if you look at, at where, say, let's say where core CPI or core PCE works, those are the, what the Fed looks, like, looks at for inflation. Um, the last three cycles, 2004, uh, core PC was 1.7. 2013, it was 1.6. Now we're talking about 7%, like on, on CPI, that not PC, but 7% on CPI. Um, if you look at like something like Jolts, which I think is a, a good indicator, um, it's around 10 million now, and it was like 4 million in the other cycles. Uh, if you look at, you can see this all on the table, but it, almost everything is just completely different now that this economy is you can argue this is like an overheating like not, definitely not hyperinflationary but extremely inflationary reflationary economy like something that i haven't seen in my lifetime i mean never in my lifetime were restaurants closing for three days because there's not enough people to work at them right and that's all that kind of stuff is happening so i i think like in global macro it's very first of all, logical, but also very popular to find analogs. So you say like, oh yeah, this feels like the cycle, this feels like what happened in 2012, or this feels like what, and then you can kind of benchmark. And the famous one was, that's how Paul Tudor Jones predicted the crash of 1987 was, you know, there was other charts that looked like that and, and predicted, so he predicted that way. So it's a useful way of predicting things. That's kind of what like, it's pattern recognition. It's kind of what a lot of people do. Um, but I think, it's wrong right now because there is not a good analog to to this. This is like crazy town, you know, historic stuff that's happened in the last 18 months. And you can really see that if you put, if you look at any graph of economic data, like what I've been doing in my writing is essentially like, if I wanna show a graph of like, okay, here's what retail sales look like over the last 10 years, I just clipped 2020 out of there because the you know it blows up the y axis it's it's completely insane so to uh, any analogy that's looking at recent cycles just doesn't make any sense to me and i think people are getting lulled to sleep by this idea that oh it'll be everything's going to be all right and i'm just i just don't believe it partly because it's happening so fast um partly because of the starting point which means that you know in 2018 they, they were hiking and, and Powell said we're a long way from neutral. And then they were cutting a year, like in, in whatever, June 2019. And they were already signaling they were going to cut by January 2019 because stocks collapsed on Christmas Eve 2018. 
if stocks drop 20% right now, they're not cutting rates. You know, they're not re-embarking on a QE program. So to me, the Fed put is not around. And I just don't think any of that's been fully appreciated. So in equities or in crypto where like it should, people in equity should appreciate it um, because that's, you know, we've been through so many cycles. In crypto, I think people are just too focused on the idiosyncratic, you know, what token's going to be, what token's going to beat what token or, or, you know, Bitcoin dominance over Ethereum. And they're missing out on the, on the whole like global macro, which is, you know, money debasement, fiat debasement has run its course for this cycle. And now it's about to be rebased. <laughs> Fiat's about to make a bit of a comeback. Yeah, no, I mean, when, when people ask me, because it's really difficult, because people want to go back to 1999, people want to go back to 2007, they, they want a benchmark, they, they want, but, and, but, but they want a modern benchmark, and I'm like, uh, try 1933, 1934, how, how about that, how does that work for you, and they're like, what, and I'm like, I'm like, these are big dollar figures that we're talking about here, and, 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 and you know, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, how quickly, stocks declined when the pandemic hit and you had to go back to 1933 to find a parallel and i'm like whoa something big is going on here and then they came right. flying right back and i went whoa something even bigger is going on here and i think that i think people are I, I i agree with you people are missing the forest for the trees and um but but that takes us to a whole separate subject because whether you're talking about new zealand or australia or the netherlands or your home country if something breaks in the global economy, there are housing bubbles that make subprime in 07 look like a walk in the park. I don't know where you find this stuff. You put something up on like some house in Toronto and maybe you can refresh my memory of what the flip time was. Yeah, sure. In fact, maybe you can just share that with us so we can put it up on the screen. And I was like, what did he just, did he, is that a typo? Yeah, I mean, we can put it up on the screen right now. So you can see someone bought a, a home for a million dollars and flipped it for 1.7 in 14 months uh, with no renos. And th that's not like, you know, I'm always cautious about these cherry picked anecdotes of like the one crazy thing that happened. This is not like that. There, There's hundreds of these. Um, so I'm not actually as pessimistic on housing as I am um, on other things, uh, on other asset classes simply because I think part of this is monetary, which, like I said, I think the tide is coming back out in the monetary world, but then part of it is, is supply. So to me, this is like a generational transfer of wealth from commercial to residential real estate because of work from home. So I think people want to invest a larger percentage of their income um, or of their net worth in real estate versus what they want to do before the pandemic. And I think that's like a one-time level shift that that won't come back. So that doesn't mean that prices have to keep going up. But um, like what you saw in 2018, I think um, makes kind of similar, could be kind of similar where in 2018, when liquidity started coming out, housing prices stopped going up, but they didn't really come off. Um, and each country has its own idiosyncratic stories. Like in Canada, there is not very much supply. Like there's a lot of immigration in Canada, 400,000 you know, people last year, 400,000 this year, which is decent in a country of 36 million people. Um, and then, you know, if you look at, we can put this chart up, private dwellings to population in Canada is very low for a whole bunch of reasons. So um, I'm not as bearish on housing, although I do see like it's gone crazy. And one part that that's really um, to me, it's almost more like an ethical thing than than a financial thing. But the amount of investment buying of homes in an, in a time when you know individuals can't buy homes is kind of uh, I don't know. It doesn't feel very it doesn't feel right to me. But whatever, free markets, I guess. Um, you know, like investment consortiums putting money together to like buy entire street blocks and all that. Um, but I mean, there's no law against it. They're not doing anything wrong by the book, by the rules, but, um, that is also contributing to, to the demand side and that will dry up as financial conditions tighten. So to me, housing is like crazy, but I don't think it's as vulnerable just because it's kind of like the market is short, right? Like, like there's like a natural short position where a lot of people want to buy homes and 
don't have them. And what happens generally over time is you get stopped into buying it over time. So like, okay, say I'm 28 and I live with my parents, then I'm 30, then I meet someone, I get married. Finally, wherever housing prices are, if I can afford it, I end up just saying, okay, screw it, I'm gonna buy a house. Um, so I think that eventually that demand is just latent sitting there of people that just can't afford to do it and eventually will just kind of be forced into it. Um, so I think there's not just a demand. So like in a bubble, it's all about demand and usually it's leveraged. And like, so people are borrowing money to buy. And then when prices start going down, everyone has to sell to repay the loans. In this case, much more of like around me, a lot of the buying is like 50% cash, 100% cash. Um, and then in Canada, a lot of it is related to not being enough. There aren't enough single family homes um, for all the, the new immigration. So, you know, each country has its own thing. But the funny thing is, if you look at all the countries, like if you look at a bar chart of all the countries, they're basically all up 20% roughly. So that argues it's more monetary than, than idiosyncratic, right? Like it's if, if every single country is up 20%, then it's kind of stupid to be talking about like Canadian supply issues, you know, because obviously if every country is up 20%, the primary driver is probably monetary. And then you have all these secondary drivers everywhere. So I think there's basically always going to be a bid for housing um, and there won't be as much panic selling. Whereas I feel like 05, 06, 07, I mean, I worked at Lehman, so I know as well as anyone because they were buying like billions of dollars of Las Vegas real estate and then they had to sell it. Um, is that, you know, the real trigger for an unwind of a bubble is the forced selling that's caused by people that borrowed and levered and, you know, but bought $100 worth of real estate with $10 down. Um, and then when prices drop 20%, you're underwater. I don't think that's as much of a thing in housing. However, um, I mean, it's you look at these things like that graphic that we showed before, and it's hard not to, to be a little bit worried. A little. I'm, I'm gonna have to agree with you there, Brent, just a little. Just a, just a wee bit. Just a smidge. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, investors are pushing a third of the market here in the United States, and they're using leverage. It's just leverage we can't really see. Which is, a, you know, well, we could go off on that tangent for like a day and talk about it. Maybe in a canoe with some wine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> in any event, um, I'm going to wrap this up and ask you one question. How did you come up with your, with your mantra, good luck, be nimble? Oh, I mean, I've been so looking at it for years and I'm like, where, where did he come up with that? So when I was younger, um, when I first started doing client things, so you would go to like, you know, in those days, and there's still actually mostly the same names, but there was like five to eight big names in hedge fund trading that were like the famous people that you kind of looked up to that were like the, you know, the heroes or whatever. So I wouldn't interact with them, but I would interact with like people that worked for them. So I would always ask them like, hey, what do you like, why is this guy such a legend and what makes him such an incredible trader? And unanimously or not unanimously but almost unanimously was they would say oh well he'll come into the morning meeting and say like i'm bullish euro for six reasons and then at four o'clock euros down you know 80 points and you look in his book and he made money and he's like well yeah you know things changed i got short so it's like that ability there there's this thing there's a cliche or like a saying which is um strong views weekly held which is like do a lot of research and believe in, in your own opinion, but then be open to new information and be ready to change your view. And I think as an investor, that's not as important because um, you have more staying power and, and you don't use leverage generally. But as a trader, you really have to be flexible enough to, to react to, to changes in the inf in, and react to new information pretty quickly. Now, obviously, that can mean that you just get blown all over the place by every crosswind and you're Mr. Flip Flop, and that's not good. Um, so it's always finding that balance. But for me, the worst times that I've traded was when I just had this view and I, and I just couldn't let go of it. And obviously, if it was right, it wouldn't matter. But if it was wrong, you know, you're, it's the old, like, if you loved it at 10, you're going to love it at five and you're going to want to buy even more at $2.50, right? Um, so being nimble, I think is like really like the smart person's way of thinking about it would be like being Bayesian. So you have a prior view and you have all the information 
but a good Bayesian then adjusts as new information comes in, takes their prior, you know, whatever your probability expectation of something happening was X, then as new information comes in, don't just filter out that information because it doesn't agree with you. Try to be open to new information and flexible and then adapt, right? And, and Well, I mean, you, you recently did this and I kind of made it really famous on Twitter, or I, I at least, I, I, there, I put a little bit of a flashlight on it, but within 24 hours, you had changed your viewpoint on gold. Right. Uh, so that's a, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, and actually, that's a skill that I've, I've developed simply by recognizing that I, I need to do it. And then once you start doing it a bunch of times, you don't feel as bad. Um, but also, I'm fortunate because my switching costs are pretty low. Like people kind of know me and generally know, like sometimes I change my mind and I'm transparent and I'm honest about it. And it's a bit embarrassing, but whatever, life goes on. Um, but if you're like a strategist at um, a major investment bank, you can't be saying I'm bullish one day and then say, you know what, actually some new information came in. I'm bearish now. Yeah. It's just much more difficult for a lot of strategists to switch. Um, whereas as a trader, your switching cost is just like whatever the bidder is, right? Like you should be able to switch if the new information comes in. Um, so I kind of like got over it over time because it is embarrassing to say like one day I'm bearish and, and especially when I'm writing about it and all that. And then two days later say, well, you know what, actually I'm not bearish. Um, but I think it's a strength, not a weakness. Um, and I think generally people view it like that. If you explain why, you know, not just like, oh, I have a weird gut feeling. Um, if you say, okay, I've analyzed all this new information and, you know, now my view is different. I think people respect that, even though as a person doing it, it kind of feels a little bit uncomfortable. Well, but uh, look, uh, but you're absolutely right. And if there's one thing that I've heard, uh, you've heard the nimble and, and you obviously play it out in, in real life. And, and I've always heard that you have to have a really strong cell discipline. And it's kind of along the same lines as that. Uh, Brent, I have, I've learned so much in the space of however long we've been talking, an hour. And, um, and I really appreciate the new you, the non, non shackled by compliance, Brent, uh, macro yeah. Brent. Twitter, Brent, uh, it's just awesome. So I, I, I wanna come back, I wanna do this in a year. Let's do this in person in New York. Yes, sure. let's do this. Um, and awesome. thank you so much for, sp for spending so much time. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, it's fun. Love, love hanging out with you.